Okay. Uh, we got the hello Twitch. Um, here. Let's see when it arrives on screen. Okay. We'll wait a few minutes for everything to settle, but feel free to say hello in the chat if you're watching. Hey, Tony. We're going to go look at the Versal AI Edge today. I hope you're ready to um, explore um, well, we're, we're just going to go over some like basic Vivado and Vitus implementation for the Versal. We'll see how that goes. Um, <laughs> and then we have another chat from Mosne. Mosne? Mosne123. Hello! Sorry if the latency's a little bit slow. Need to figure out a uh, figure out some settings. Am I going to configure carnal? Is it a mistype? I don't know what that is. <laughs> I really see the chat on views. Hmm. Yeah, some background. Um, a little bit better there. Okay been a few minutes there we go okay so let's dig in a little bit um if you come in if anyone comes in late hope we can catch them up or they can watch the vod or the video Okay, so for the Versal, um, so the Versal is a much more uh, complex device. Even uh, Xilinx or AMD Xilinx markets it as a A cap rather than a uh, an FPGA. Um, where the A cap is an application. Figurable adaptable platform or something like that. We'll, we'll look it up in a second. But yeah, um, Tony, um, the we're not gonna do any Linux kernel. Um, we, um, if you're thinking of like an HLS or AIE kernel, um, we can look at that uh, at a little bit later. The AI kernel, yeah, yeah. So we'll be looking at the AIE ML kernels probably later next week. Today we're just gonna look at a block diagram. Get the processor up and running. Um, get to do a simple hello world on the on the on the diagram on the on the uh, Vitus ARM processors, and just kind of see the general flow for uh, doing a custom hardware. And then later we can look about how you insert an AI e engine an AI engine into the block diagram, how you modify that kernel in Vitus, and how you map it. Um, it's not straightforward, and um, I need to figure out some good examples for that. So hopefully we can uh, work through that together. So uh, today, um, we're going to be looking at the iWave uh, Versal AI Edge platform. It's rather small. Let's see if I can get my hand in context. So you look the right side, right? This This kind of fits in the palm of my hand. I mean, it's a big, right? It's like... Four credit cards, about four credit card size. I can grab it with my hand, so it's not dramatic. Do I need like a banana for size? Do I go get like the? Well, we're gonna use knock today. So, um, Tony, we're gonna we're gonna look at the knock. We do some basic configurations of knock for uh, connecting the processor to the DR to the to the fabric. Um, we'll see. Oh, 
Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll walk through what the Versal is, um, what the Versal device is, what the, what the dev board does, and kind of go through the Vivado basic block diagram of Vitus classic Hello World, the new Vitus Hello World, and then we'll go look at what the PLM uh, software is doing. And then we maybe we can insert a microblaze in before uh, we finish tonight. Um, this board was donated by a uh, a a group who does uh, some space applications. They wanted to donate it, um, so they wanted to they donate it to me so I could explore it and provide some context. Um, for uh, most one two three, um, we do have an ARM core. And um, so right here, if we go back up here, we have dual core ARM A72s, which um, so for the for the Zinc, you had like a A53. So we now have a better application processor. It's a higher class than A72. But like the Zinc and the MPSOC, we still have some R5 processors, some real time application. OK, um, so we're going to move that out. OK, so the Versal AI Edge, it's an ACAP device as they try to market it. Um, I don't, maybe they got rid of that terminology. I haven't seen it recently. Um, is there anything? The main difference for uh, the AIE engine is going to be, or the Versal AI Edge is the AI, en AI engines, which we can look at probably another time. They're a whole, whole nother topic. Um, but we have a traditional programmable logic. Um, then we have this fancy network on shape, or the NOC which connects the processors to the other IOs and fancy interfaces and whatnot. Um, ooh, we have a video decoder unit. I should go, I should figure out a good example for that one. Um, is there anything else? Um, feel free to look at the documentation. Um, it is a, one of the most complex devices out there, so it's kind of hard to, um, there's a lot of documentation, a lot of examples. It's, 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 it's going to take a, a bit of effort to get some good work going on it. Um, but we look at, we have the VE2302 as a device we have. And in general, um, the what, these are just tops. So this is performance. Do we actually have the 2302? We have 34 AIE engines um, and 464 ESP engines. It'll do fabric, 300, 300K, pretty good size. Um, doo -doo -doo. Anything else? And, we're not use, using any of those at the moment. Okay, so we're using the iWave. Um, this comes with, you know, a little SOM. Uh, so under this giant massive heat sink here, right, we have a SOM. It has the AIE VE2302, um, has the, the four gigabytes of LPDDR, um, some EMC flash, and a QSPY. Um, here it is. Figure out how to get the EMMC flash working, um, and some and some you know the transceivers go through the through the bottom of it right here. So we got two high um, high density connectors, and we got the eight channels of transceivers through here, and then like the generic I/O, and then we're on this uh, board right here. And even though it so this is kind of a generic uh, carrier card for different FPGAs. So even though that has a lot of interfaces on it. This, um, the Versal Edge does not use them. The Versal Edge does not use this PCI slot. It does not use, um, use, it has the video in, video out. It does not use the QSFP slot. So no, not this, not this. And is that just, I think it's a USB. So um, a few different interfaces it doesn't use on this system. Okay. Um, so let's bring this up in Vivado. I'll go show you a kind of a finished block diagram and I'll show you kind of the steps you do to uh, uh, build it yourself. So we have this on a Steam Deck and we can go ahead and open it from a Steam Deck. Um, let's just go through the steps in case anyone is doing this from scratch. So we have um, Vivado installed at a location. We do the settings, SH, this will load some, uh, some dependencies, but mostly it's just putting the binaries on the path. And then we can just call Vivado. <laughs> yeah, Tony, the, the versals are very, very, very complex with a lot of different systems. 
Um, and it's you gotta you gotta play around with them and build them and test them to I guess be, be to know what you can actually do on these systems. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and open this little generic project, and then I'll show you how you kind of insert the SIPs, um, what configurations to look at, and um, and we'll go back to this. So for your basic, um, for your super simple um, device, um, you basically have two blocks for the block diagram. We have um, okay, uh, that, um, okay, boom. So this is called the SIPS or the Control Interface Processing System. When you drop it down, you can use board presets. You can control if it includes a processor or if it's just the PLM firmware booting up the device. You can add the NOC, which adds DDR, LPDDR banks. Yes. So I'm using X11 forwarding to look at Vivado through my Steam Deck. Um, I've talked to AMD and Intel, and I have good relationships with them, um, but no like established collaboration at the moment. Um, but I do have people I can contact and ask questions, and if they get some time, they can talk to me back. Um, I do like the Steam Deck in the situation it has relatively fast um, memory, a good enough hard drive space to be able to run these things. And I can also reflash it all if I wanna, or re-image it all if I wanna move into a different version of Linux or if I wanna use a different version of Fibato. Um, it gives me kind of a, a fun platform. And Linux is also very, is required to effectively use um, the AIE uh, simulators, compilers, and for Peta Linux. So I like having the Steam, the Steam Deck as a, a uh, a platform I can easily uh, change out. Um, I've been talking to them. I have some. I have some ongoing uh, communication. Um, uh, the Polar Berry that I looked at, that's kind of in a review um, state where it's been loaned to me. Um, but otherwise, I'm still, I guess, having some communications to review other hardware from other companies. Um, we should get a lattice board. Um, from a space company this week that'll be fun to review. Um, so that will be fun. That's uh, that's the Lattice Certus Pro with a uh, a quad core Leon processor on same board. Okay. So. <laughs> So we're gonna we're gonna take a quick look at the SIPs. Um, I don't feel like a new project's gonna help anyone at the moment, but we're gonna just kind of talk through the different configurations. Um, so these are your basic configurations. Um, so this is kind of what you do when you drop down a new block. You you specify um, are you using custom, are you using just like the traditional stuff or something like that. Um, the the true configuration that you're used to for your uh for your MP sock or your zinc device or whatnot is um it's gonna be here. And this is I would say dramatically different than um what we had on the on the MP sock. It's over here. Okay. So we have this big diagram and we can click um, the various things, right? And hopefully we would go to like that page on this side. So if you're like, hey, I want UART1 to work, I can go here and set it up. Um, so right now we just have ethernet and UART0 set up for this uh, interface. Um, didn't know that. I should figure out how to set up the uh, EMMC on this design, um, looking at the, diff the different configurations. Um, let's, if we click here, the PSPL interface. Okay, 
So let's go ahead and walk through what we have here. Okay, so I assume these are how we configure um, what the is expected to boot from. Um, where this this must modify something in the early state, the boot stage loader, to be able to um, do this. But you have the various interfaces here. There's actually other options, um, like for other virtual devices, PCIe, um, the high speed. Like there's there. This device has a lot of options for here, for these type of configurations. Um, so the peripherals, you just enable them here. You do some, you do some basic settings. And if you want to see like how it's truly mapped out, you have this uh, lock that shows you the mapping and you can do the, you can click on these things and you can modify um, the IO of each of these. Um, there's nothing, I would say dramatic at this point that we're doing with this. There's a PCI reset. Okay, um, debug. So I need to look in this because I, I I find these really interesting. Um, so I don't I don't. So the B scan is often used for your your chip scope, um, your ILAs, your microblaze debug module, and I don't know why they have this. Um, this is like a SIPS to MDM interface debug. So I guess you could potentially have the SIPS or be able to communicate your, your debugs. I don't know much about those. I have not used the cross trigger or these ARM parallel triggers before. This is the high speed debug port, um, which I haven't used either. And the Aurora, so we have we have a debug port um, that goes to this X pipe, and you can use Aurora or PCIe. I really want to learn how to do these things, but there's not good examples at the moment. Clocking, you have your input clocks, kind of basic. You have your output clocks with your PLL options. This this is this page is almost identical to the MP sock, so it should be fairly easy to follow through. Um, Okay, the Xylosim library. This is specifically for radiation upsets. So if you are a normal user, um, the EMMC is probably directly connected to the uh, to the PLM thing. So the I/O there has to be a way for the I/O to communicate without not configuration to set up the device. But it'd be interesting to look at other EMMC options. We can look at the NOC configuration in a second and see if the EMMC pops on it. Um, so for your for for your general users, I don't think you're going to be using the uh, Xylosim um, that often. Um, then we have the Sysmon. Um, this is just your basic temperaturing and alerts and voltages. Um, these are external, um, like you can use your IOs to do analog detection. You can enable these and read external current or voltages valid values. Oh, I mean, you can read voltage values that maybe come from current detectors or something like that. Device security. I haven't really looked at this much either. Here's a clock monitor. That's interesting. Um, reference clock, monitor clock. Like if I if, if I enable this, like can I just like pick any clock? Look at these ref clocks. Interesting. Um, once again, something I haven't really looked at, but would be interesting to look at. Um, okay. So this is our normal, um, this is our appeal interface. These are our normal, uh, full axi buses that communicate with the fabric. These are, um, the, what we, the slave axi buses, which allow us to communicate from the fabric to the address space in the Versal, so like DDR, DMA. Um, there's no cache coherency. There's usually cache coherency options for these, and I don't, I don't see a cache coherency option. Maybe is that? I guess a knock would be your cache coherency option. Okay. Um, do do. ADMA would be interesting. Low power domain DMA engines. 
Um, I guess you can map them to the fabric, which would be interesting to use. I need to. No, these are fabric signals. These aren't. These aren't actually buses. Uh, I'll have to look at that sometime. Okay. Um, it appears to knock. Um, some other interfaces. Oh, here we have the cache coherent and non cache coherent interfaces, and it's mostly to the knock interface. Um, the PS to knock clocks. That's an interesting thing. I need, I, I, all these options are, are massive and what you can do with them. Um, we have interrupts. Um, we have additional interrupts from every single system we can map to the fabric or map to back to the device. And then there's our IOs for the processor banks. Okay, so lots of things you can do. <laughs> okay, um, the XRAM in this situation is pretty basic. Um, this is just allows the fabric to interact with the XRAM. Nothing big there. Okay, now you saw how complex the Versal is. Now let's look at how complex the knock is. Let's see, um, can we, I need to, okay, I'll look at uh, changing that stuff later. Okay, um, so the knock, this has a lot of information and it's, and it, and it, it gets kind of complicated. So, we have like, you know, axis slave interfaces. Um, these aren't necessarily fabric. This could be fabric processor, um, uh, AI engines or some other type of interface. Um, and these, these ones are just simple so, so that you can have a knock to knock connection kind of mapped out in your block diagram. So these are just, these are just aids to help what you do. Um, here's your simple system controller. Okay. Um, so here is where we kind of determine what each interface is connected to. Um, so these are connected to a processor, cache coherent systems, the low power domain, and the PMC processor. The outputs, um, we don't have any at the moment, but here the connectivity is important. So this connectivity shows you what you communicate with. Um, in this situation, the MC are your memory controller ports. So we have four memory controller ports. And we basically have um, we basically have the processors, the various processor interfaces distributed among the memory controller ports, and then quality of service. Um, this is just prioritizing um, what each relationship, right? So this is between each relationship, uh, what expected bandwidth is, and this helps the run the. Uh, knock, uh, place and router, which we'll, we'll look at in a second. Yes, so Tony, were you asked about how to do the different instances of the knock act as one? Yes, when when you finally do the placement and routing, they will, they will kind of, they will, in reality, be one system. Um, in the block diagram, you can have multiple modules and they kind of just, they kind of just connect to each other. And um, they they allow you to kind of uh, separate out a little, uh, kind of make islands of systems where the knock kind of jumps from one knock instance to another knock instance. Um, Monsignor one two three asks what uh, what uh, what's the A cap for? So the Versal A cap is basically it's targeting a lot of different systems, right? So if we went back here. They, they are trying to reach the market in, well, at least for the edge devices, um, AI on the edge. So automobiles would be great. Robotics would be great. Um, unmanned aerial, yeah. All this, all these different uh, applications. Space will be great for this. Um, what other embedded applications could you see? Um, I mean, robotics in any app, uh, situation would probably be very useful for this. Uh, localized language models. I want. I want to try to do a localized language model. Um, I don't think we have enough DDR for it though. Okay. Um. Then there's an address remap. This is nice. I like having an address remap. So you pick the interface. 
outgoing interface, incoming address, we don't have it at the moment. I do like that, that's nice. I always have to do that manually. I like how they do it that way. Um, so we just introduce our DDR, we have a DDR memory, all our parameters. Um, pretty useful, pretty easy to map out. Um, one of my favorite features, one of my favorite features is they're not here. I think I have to go to DDR. Where is it? Advanced ECC. Uh, did I miss where the parity check is? ECC. Okay, ECC is right there. Must maybe do the other DDR, but they do support address parity. I like a lot. Doesn't pop up if I click that, right? Okay, we won't worry about it at the moment. Maybe if we no. Okay. Um, okay. So when we run validation. Um, okay. Yeah, when we run validation, um, one of the stages. Tony, um, steps is mandatory. It, it it's how it does the how it, it's how it decodes your program device image, um, which is important. Okay, so here is our knock configuration. When you validate your block diagram, you go through and do kind of placement and routing for your knock. Um, yeah, let's look at the knock. Take a closer look here. So, um, oh, we want to why is that? Okay, so there are these are your slave interfaces, and the green are your master interfaces. Um, knock site properties, right? So I don't I don't know all of these yet. I need to learn the various different ones. But there's there's multiple interfaces for interacting with a device. So these are all the processor related ones. Your DDR controller. Um, here we have a switch. So these these ones these kind of unhighlighted ones are switches. Then we have the PL. So right here we have five knock interfaces for master and five knock interfaces for slave to interact with the PL. And then up here we have the AI engine where we, I think we, is it six? Yeah, so we have six slaves and six masters for AI, AI e cores. And um, still need to learn more about that and how to set it up. Okay, so um, let's, let's actually, what's, what would be interesting thing? Let's open up the implemented design real quick. Um, and let's look at, how the device is placed and routed at the moment. Um, it's an, basically an empty bitstream, right? We don't actually have anything in the fabric at the moment. But I'm curious to how the device image will uh, show you anything. Okay, so here is our device image. Um, do we have anything actually used? I guess this is our processor system. That's where the SIPS is. Here's our uh, DDR, right? Yeah, yeah, these are DDR interfaces. Um, yeah, so DDR. Now let's see where do they specify the UART anywhere. Knock. Um, the SIPS. The XRAM. That's. Those are all just. Can we map it out. 
Oh, okay. That's interesting. Um, so things are crowding the fabric, potentially. Oh, are these clocks or something? Um, that's a global logic. Global logic. So yeah, I'm not exactly sure what we're doing here for the design. But um so up here is where we have the AIE engines. Ooh. Okay, I want I want to look at these blocks real quick. <laughs> Sorry, we're gonna go on a fun little tad tangent. So um let's see what we got here. We have a shim switch. A memory away array switch, a memory um, memory tile. Um, we have an array switch. We have the ML core and the memory with it, and a switch and an AI core. Okay, so we have the processors. We have the processor memory, and then we have additional dedicated memory. And this is our AI AIE ML array. So we have thirty two, right? Thirty two. 32 or 34 um, processors, but then we have five. Okay, we have 17. So we have 34 AIE processors and 17 additional memory units. Okay. Okay. Um, so here is our setup for our system. So let's go ahead and we're gonna look at um, how we how we set up a hello world on this system. So we're gonna go to Vitus Classic because I do not like I do not know the new Vitus yet. So we'll go through the Vitus Classic flow. And that way you have, we can go through both of the examples and see what's happening. Um, so my, my uh, Steam Deck, so Monster 123, my Steam Deck has 16 gigs. Um, so for the Steam Deck, you, um, you share the VRAM with your processing. So I had to, I had to go into the BIOS and change the VRAM. 16 gigabytes, but VRAM reduced to like uh, 256 megabytes, for example. Okay. Um, we have Vitus is up and running somewhere. Let me go find it. There we go. Okay. Um, oh no, we want to set up a new one. So let's go open a new workshop. We could just walk through all the steps. It's pretty fast. Um, cool. Call this a new name. So we're gonna go through the UART, then we're gonna compile for the course site. Okay. Um, so, okay, we're in Vitus. Um, we want to do a hello world. So we're going to do create application project. Um, go next. Um, so this step, we're going to go to create a new platform from hardware from an XSA file. We've exported an XSA file from, um, from Vitus already, um, or from Vivado. So we have a top level XSA file. And this basically has all the information from our block diagram. So it should have the, D the processor and the DDR configuration. Um, we're going to just use the first A72 processor, and we're going to call it Hello World. Um, standalone, we're not doing Linux or RTOS or anything. 
yeah so tony we'll look at the new vitus this is the old vitus we'll look at the new vitus um in a few minutes and then we'll do yeah hello world okay um i'm gonna have to actually plug in the uh the versal now okay turning on the versal um so let's go ahead and just take a quick peek at what we have going here right we're initializing the profile platform and then just doing a simple hell world nothing dramatic okay let's go open that declaration um and we just enable caches enable uards let's, let's... yeah boot rom configures okay so it's just just kind of bringing everything together. Okay, doki. So let's go ahead and build it. And let's go here and we're gonna set up a screen real quick. So if we do, uh, if we do D message, right? D message, message um, tail. We now have multiple USBs. TTY USB zero is our JTAG. TY USB one is the first UART. And there's potentially other UARTs on this system. I'll need to look at those from the documentation better. So let's go screen. Um, we're gonna go dev TTY USB one. We're gonna do a baud rate, right? Okay, cool. And we should be ready to you know right click this. And we're going to just launch on hardware. Okay. Useful stuff. So the first thing that's going to run when you do the PTI file, right? So we have, we have a PDI file that we send. So if we go to, um, top export, um, top hardware. We have a PDI file. Um, this one is the new one. Okay, so the PDI file has the PLM firmware, the bid file, the not configuration, and the A72 application ELF file. Um, and that's loaded up. And so what this is doing, um, we have these different images and there's labels and IDs for them. If we, if we look at the documentation and investigate a little bit more, we would be able to determine which image is going to which section of the device. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. And so this is all just getting the Versal up and running. And then we run our application out of the A72. Now we have a working system. Okay, so now let's do a quick helpful aid for everyone. Um, sometimes you don't have a UART or your UART is doing other things, which a lot of times I was like, as long as you have JTAG, you can get some good communication. So we're gonna go through real quick and explain how we can send um, standard in and out for the for the application through uh, through JTAG. So opening the board support, settings, we should be able to modify it comes up. Okay, here we go. Um, they always make this extremely tall for some reason. Okay. Probably just the X11 forwarding that's causing issues. Okay. So we're going to go to standalone and um, stretch this out a little bit so you can see it. So right here, we have the UART selected. We can now go to core site and core site is the ARM, JTAG, debug, DAP controller, right? Um, so we can hit okay here and this will have, we'll have to rebuild our platform. So we'll rebuild the system. The, the green check mark should not work but we can go ahead and rebuild this yeah basically so the pdi file is um 
a small bootloader, a bitstream, a not configuration, and your application software all packaged into one binary. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of a small OS. It, we'll look at the PLM firmware in a bit, that, 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 which is basically the OS, the small OS that's running. Um, okay, so we rebuild this. Okay, we finished building actually. Um, so we're gonna run this, and I'm gonna show you the usefulness of CoreSight. Um, call it the PLM firmware. Okay. Um, my chat is not very good on this white background. It'll be better in a second. Okay, so if we go here, right? Um, it's really hard to see. Let me see if I can go like this. Right here. See, I'm um, not that one. This arrow. This arrow right here. So, hmm. so we have a debug virtual terminal for each processor. So the useful thing of using CoreSight is that we can we can have like a dedicated JTAG terminal per processor, and that can be useful when you're doing multi-processor applications, or you have the R5s doing an application, uh, a real-time application, and the A72s are doing Linux. So this is very useful if you want to be able to get some information out of the system over JTAG during operation. We have the hello world working here. And that's, for now, that's all we're going to do for the uh, the Vitus Classic. Let's go look at, uh, let's go look at the new Vitus. Oh, it looks like, uh, interesting. So if we look at new Vitus, Right, so if we go to tools and we say we want to launch launch the Vitus IDE, this will pull in the new Vitus tools. And we'll make a, a new workshop and we'll show you how to create a platform and to target a hello world example into this new uh, system. Okay. So we're going to open a workshop um, do, 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 down the bottom, grab here, create a new one, call it workshop do, do, one. I don't like that name, but it's okay. Um, well, there's a DAP controller. So there's a traditional ARM DAP controller um, that allows debug to each processor. Um, Okay, let me show you an example, right? Okay, we're here. If we do XSDB, uh, right, pull up the Xilinx debugger, let's, let's, let's look at how the uh, JTAG uh, communicates to the processors. Okay, so targets. So um, there's a DAP controller, a debug controller that communicates to all of these interfaces. So yes, each of these interfaces, I, um, potentially the PMC2, have kind of dedicated little uh, debug terminals on a, on a larger debug uh, controller. Um, so you can communicate with each of these individually. Um, okay, yeah, and Tony, I'm not sure we got your question covered, but yeah, each processor can have its own independent task. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create a platform component. Um, and here we're basically going to go to the same process. We're going to browse for the XSA file. We're going to load it. We're going to wait for this to read the information. Hmm. Okay, maybe we could try a lower bit rate. Okay, a lower bit rate and um, what's an audio? No, a video. Okay, we'll, 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 I'm gonna play around with keyframes and bit rates. Okay, so we're gonna play same thing, standalone on the first application processor, and we'll finish. This creates a little uh, platform project.
Okay. So we have our platform here. Now we're going to go and bring in an example. And, you know, like, here if we want to do AI examples, we can look at those in the future. But right now we want to look at a Hello World application. So we're going to say create application component from template. Um, we're going to you know, call it Hello World. We're going to select the platform that we just created. We're going to use the, the processor we selected in that situation. And now we have the Hello World application under sources. And oh, we didn't look at a linker script. I want to see. Does this have a linker script setting? Let's see here. Okay. We can add regions. Does it no? No, it doesn't. Do you like control Z? Or do I delete it? <laughs> um, maybe do I have to click this? Ah, oh, here we go. Click this. Ah, get rid of that. Boom. Go back to this. Okay. And we have stack and locations. Um weird. This is Is it sticking in the axi knock for this? It, that's so confusing. Um uh, I guess that's a DDR. So it's putting into DDR. We could put it into this physical RAM if we want. But yeah, it's all running in DDR at the moment. Okay, um, and then we have the same software. Okay, so now we can go down here and we hit build. We hit okay. Um, FYI, this Vitus, the new Vitus can be buggy, so be careful. Um, so Tony, um, question about my work experience. I work mostly, like personally, I have a bunch of low end, eh, low end devices, right? Devices in the $100 ranges. Like this is Avnet's new uh, Avnet's new ZU board, and it's like 150, 180. This is a Light Fury, Night Fury that you can get off Amazon for like 100 or 150. Um, you have the the Kira board, which is like 250. Um, the already the already kind of ranged in price. You can get a small. A, a cheaper one like a hundred but the the expensive one goes like 250 or 300 or something like that so this can be this one's pretty expensive now i have some cheaper ones too um but most of my personal stuff is medium low end i do have some few a few high ends that i bought off uh crypto miners um work um work i i, I do small rtx fpjs i also do large vertex fpjs rf socks mp socks I have all mostly mostly Xilinx. I'm trying to expand my personal um to go to other families, but mostly Xilinx. And I probably worked on most Xilinx FPGAs. I don't most of the recent ones. Um, I've done some HBM one, some RF sock stuff. But I, I I think I touched most of Xilinx's product line. Okay, I feel like I missed your YouTube comment uh, most about what, about sticking to the older Vado and Vitus versions. Yeah, um, unfortunately, you need the brand new version to get the brand new tools working. Okay, let's open up screen again. Do right here, and then we're going to run this. Um, it's a little bit. This is a little bit uh, janky, and it sometimes gets stuck, and I have to like close it, reopen it, but whatnot. Okay, so we have the same thing, and we loaded the software, we ran the software, yay. Um, and then we can go in, and if we wanted to, uh, we go to settings, we now have a JSON file. Um, and if we go to the board support package, we can do the same thing and modify the uh, standalone drivers here. I gotta say, this is a little nicer in the newer tools. I do like it in this tools. Mazai. Okay, yeah. I loaded the course site. Um, go back to Hello World. We can, we can build it. Uh, 
Okay, um, we got a we have a debug session in play. Oh, let's see. Built it. Um, we go here. We we want to terminate this, right? Um, is there a way to terminate? Okay. Um, now we go, this is in debug. Let's try to run this normally. And this is, I've been trying to get the core site to work. It appears here and it's not as nice as the, the, the Eclipse base Vivado classic or Vitus classic tools. Um, but we can see if it pops up. Um, and it was going to be this one. Yeah, it didn't pop up. It's kind of annoying here. Okay. So we've gone through Hello World on the on the Vitus or on the Versal with Avado and Vitus. Let's go dig a little bit into what the PLM firmware does. I'm gonna go look at that in Vivado Classic. So let's bring this back up, bring up things, and I'll show you how you can um how you can load in a PLM firmware version that you can look at. Okay, we're gonna launch our, our little workspace again. I'll bring it over as soon as it's loaded. Okay. So um, now, like say, so the PLM firmware, that little OS, right? Um, that little OS that, that boots the device, we can modify it. We have complete control over it. So let's go and talk about what we want to do to modify that. We can we can we can do a lot of cool stuff. Um, I don't need a platform. I need an application. Um, we're gonna. Oh yeah, we're gonna use the same application. Um, I guess we use the Hello system. We're gonna call this the PLM um, firmware. Um, go all processors. Sorry. Um, the Okay, so we're gonna go to the the which one is it? Is it the PMC? Um, let me see. Might have to back up. There, we're good here. We're just acting slow. Oh, oh. <laughs> I think uh, I, I think my uh, Steam Deck lost power real quick. I had to unplug it. Oh, I'm surprised it died so quickly. We must have been using a lot of power for that. Okay, we're going to open it up locally instead. So if we open up uh, Classic, I'm going to open this up on my local machine on windows instead okay um okay come on vitus go here we go let's see do, do, do. browse for this give me a second Aha, here we go. Um, yeah, sure. Hopefully that comes up. Oh, this will be awkward. okay. Cool, cool. Um, so this is a, another processor where I am looking at the dynamic clock. 
Um, so we're going to do the same little flow here. Oh, it is happy. Oh, so. This team deck is alive. It's fine. I don't know what happened. Unless it's not been happy about that. Okay, we can do it here. Uh, that's fine. And then we can maybe do a micro place drop if I want to stay up longer. Okay, yeah. Um, system. I'm going to pick the other one this time. Um, I can't, I'm pretty sure it's a PMC, actually. So we'll say a PLM firmware. Next. Okay. Versal PLM. Yeah. So let's boot this up and let's look at what the PLM does. So this is the little, little software that runs um, as your kind of your first stage bootloader. It has software that, you know, kind of reads the PDI, loads the knock, loads the fabric, loads the powers on and, and starts the arm, the arm processors. And this is a lot of source code. So we're going to try to take it one step at a time. OK, so. Um, we just kind of just a quick dive in. Analyze the processor. So we have a bunch of tasks we have. So there's a list of tasks. What tasks? Where do we find the tasks? Okay, peel and update, start timers, DMA, perform task init. So let's go look at what tasks um, we're initializing during this process. Um, so we have a task queue and we're going through the index. Um, this task queue is here. Um, where is it being used? Okay, so kind of curious where we list the tasks. It's gonna be an H file where we specify all the different tasks we're doing. Mm. Probably just in a bunch of these different locations. Oh, there's so much it could be potentially doing here. Okay, so it's doing the UART, big UART. Um, so we can have complete control over over the uh, the PLM firmware. So we could complete. We can write our own firmware from scratch if we are confident that it would uh, work appropriately. Okay, platform, same thing. I'm just trying to look for XRAM, get board params, get UR base to do from pre init. Okay. Let's go back to main. See if there's something. Where did go? Oh, it's all in here. We're not even we're not even in this part right here. Um, so startup. Okay, so here's our tasks: the pre-boot task, load boot, hook after PDI boot. Um, task. So many things. Okay, uh, I'm curious what a loader. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of my goals um, in the future is I want to I want to design a a secure, reliable um, PLM firmware for space applications. So hopefully I can master this and be able to. Um, figure out the best ways to modify that to provide a better system. And that's, yeah. Um, okay, so with a 
Okay, so the Steam Deck is fine. So let's go back to the Steam Deck real quick. Not sure why we killed it. Probably an error with their tools. Um, we're going to source that now. Uh, uh, settings again. And we're going to do Vivado. So let's go ahead and throw a microblade into the design and see how we can add, add even more processors. Um, for the for the few people who are watching, looks like about eight people. Um, what applications would you are you curious to see the Versal use? back here let's drop it to microblaze i don't remember how long it's going to take to figure it out um okay so opening the block design um i guess we want to do microblaze to ddr would probably be the, the most useful thing Okay. I'll have to play around with those settings to get this better. Okay, so we should try. Sorry, I'm looking at. How to improve my video quality. Okay, yeah, we should do one. Okay. Um so we're gonna drop in a microblaze here. Sorry, I was trying to figure out how to improve the quality of my streaming. So we're gonna drop the microblaze down. Um, we're gonna run automation. Yep, yep. Um, local memory sixteen is fine. Um, yeah, go ahead. Throw in sixteen. Yeah, we want a cache interface and we send it to the uh that should work fine okay cool probably down a micro blaze So we're going to run automation connection. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so now we're going to go here. We're going to add in one interface. We're going to go, we want one of these. And we want to go here. It's going to be PL interface, exactly this. So now we've added one. Um, we want to go connectivity. And we want to say the PL will do that memory port. 
We hit OK. Um, and then we could potentially do address remapping if we wanted to, so that it could. Uh, we can do that real quick. I'm curious. Um, so we're going to. Yeah. Um, Yeah, it's fine. Okay, so you said it's already connected data. <laughs> Do you? I don't see anything connected. Fish. Um, add IP, smart connect. I'll do it myself. Fish. Um, we'll just run the same clock. Um, run that there, whatever clock this is feeding here. Okay, you happy? I did it myself. Um, oh yeah, we're fine with that. Um, so if we go to the address editor, the microblaze. Um, okay, we're just going to have to add the lower one. If we assign this, it's going to be So it's only doing a small portion. Interesting. Um, curious how that maps to it. Um, supposed to be identical. Um, let's try to remap it. Um, I mean, I mean, do eight. You should be able to go higher. Ah, uh, I see. So that's what your aperture is. Okay. Um, let's go back to here. I want to see. I want to try this uh, interface. So if we go here, address remap. I want to say we can't do it for the memory controller. Okay, cool. Um, well, let's go here. We're going to put this back at 512 and put this at 6. This is going to write to the uh, top portion of the DDR. And if we had 64 bits, we could write to the other portion. Okay. Um, do this. Oh, we have any questions? Um, bonus. I'm sorry. Um, that didn't come through. Okay, bonus. Uh, one, two, three. You talked about what applications for space for the space application. Um, so let me see. Where'd my mouse go? Oh, what are you not happy about? Oh, I'll have to add that real quick. Okay, where's my mouse? Okay, um, can I reply? I need to do a reply. Can't reply to you. Okay, um, so the PLM firmware for space would use um, the Dial sim for scrubbing, but also include other backup backups for air catching and um, recovery. That sound like that? That sounds right. Okay, so we need to add another clock to this guy. It wants a second clock. 
give it a second clock. And it wants the clock that's driving this one. This one. Properties. Clock is driving this clock. Um. Okay. Uh, I assume one of these clocks. They can't connect. What can I connect it to? Does this have a clock output I can use? How do we... How do I get a clock for that interface? Right, you were angry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do I need to add a clock? Or there has to be a way to add a clock. Oh, okay, um, seven. Um, I hit okay. Basically, what you want me to do, get rid of this clock and drive it. Manually go that. So you should be happy now. Okay, cool. So now we have a new knock interface here, which is a slave interface from the fabric. So the DDR can now write messages. Um, we can save it, we can build it, and see how long it takes to build. Um, I'm not sure how much more longer I have energy to stay on. We'll see how long it takes to uh, synthesize. I have eight cores, two, six cores. monitor my uh, Steam Deck uh, capacity. Hmm. I'll fix that. I have to kill our little camera on the Let's go ahead and phone back. Okay, I'm gonna turn off the turn off that picture real quick. Cool. Okay. A little issue. Okay. Uh, okay, the processors aren't doing too much. Let's go ahead and look at the design run. So the design runs here. Okay. Um, let's go answer that question. Did you? I work for a, what do you say, an FPGA based radio. Um, I mostly, I mostly work on just doing system level design with FPGAs. I, I, I help a lot with the interfaces, bringing up custom PCBs, um, dealing with like a lot of unique FPGA features. Um, I don't do much digital signal processing. I don't do much um, RF. I do not do much uh, PCB design. It's mostly just being a specialist in FPGAs that I mainly work on.
I'm also a PhD student. I'm also generally like FPGAs as a hobby and spend my own personal time and money on it. Mm -hmm. I call it for let's see. Log. Um how far are we running here? Yeah, you finished. Kind of curious. This shouldn't take too much longer. Then we can get a hello world. Let's just let's, let's just have a goal to get hello world working on the uh microblaze. And then I can Go to bed. <laughs> okay. Is there anything? Yeah. Put that one. Okay. Any other questions while we watch a super boring screen of a uh, of a uh, synthesis tool? Prod probe the uh, Twitch chat. My two viewers. <laughs> okay. Done. That's good. Hmm. When's next stream? Okay. Um try tomorrow same time on soft console and the polar fire FOC. Hopefully, people have people have some interest in the Polar Fire SOC. It's a really cool device. It's a little bit more niche than um, I would hope. Let's go back to multi streams. Multi stream catching. Um, yeah. So, micro, micro, micro semi bought by micro. Chip has a has a hard risk five processor. Let's see. While we're waiting, I want to see if I can get the chat box to be slightly transparent, right? Is the parents? Like that. So, where background color is the transparency in the background? Yeah, where's the transparency for that, Joe? Yeah, I'm just I'm just doing the messages to uh, to have a recording and hopefully reduce latency a little bit. So yeah, I'm I'm having fun chatting. <laughs> we'll see how that works out in the VOD. Um, did you? Where is there a? There's nothing on 
Okay. Oh, is that three blue dealer clean? Does that change? That's a change. The box. Got to put a little thing around it to make it feel better. Okay, so we finished synthesis doing implementation of the design now. Oh. This is probably the hardest part of trying to do a live stream of FPGA development. You're going to have this uh, potentially, you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes, up to an hour, two hours compilation time. We're doing synthesis, place, and routing, and stuff like that. Okay. We're only in link. Um, I think we're going to worry about the microblaze and the AIE MLs um, later next week. And we're probably going to close it here. <laughs> uh well, good luck uh, waking up on time. Um, feel free to uh, watch the VOD. Um, I could look at doing some streams on the other side of the timeline, but that would probably be more like 2 o'clock in the afternoon for you, but <laughs> that's going to be early in the morning for me. We're basically just trading. Okay. Um if you're watching this, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments. You can go to Discord, um, FPJ Zealot on Twitter. Um, feel free to just post questions, ask um, about how to get into FPJs, what board, what board application would be good to start with. Um, FPJs are daunting; they do take a lot of work, but um, they're I, I I like them a lot, and I would. Say they're really good for um, startups. Doing prototyping for startups, FPGAs cover a lot of bases. And your final product may not have an FPGA, but if you can get good at prototyping on an FPGA, you can probably get the first stage to getting to investors or something of a startup. Okay, so um, we're going to call it a night. Um, is there anything? How about we just close on on go back to reading mode? Oh. Okay. Good night. Um, like, subscribe, follow, whatever you want to do. I'll try to get more.